Planet Nine is a hypothetical planet in the outer regions of our solar system. But the mystery planet may be closer and easier to find than first expected. Konstantin Batygin, an American astronomer and professor of planetary sciences at Caltech, joins me to discuss his hunt for Planet Nine, along with the potential of finding life in our solar system. Join us as we get Rebelliously Curious. Constantine, thank you for joining me on Rebelliously Curious. So you're an astronomer and you're also a professor of planetary science at Caltech. Before we get into Planet Nine, and I have and along with everyone else watching, has so many questions around Planet Nine. First, I'd just like to know, how did you get into astronomy? Uh, Totally by accident. I got introduced to, um, you know, generally the, in fact, I switched my major to astrophysics on day one of college because um, some guy suggested that it was a good idea. And I don't think he was a student. Well, he, I don't know. It was UC Santa Cruz, so it's hard to differentiate a student from a professor, from a hobo, from just like a random person lurking on campus. Uh, but there's a guy who, um, you know, when I went down to kind of base of campus to turn in some form to declare, to like pre-declare my major, guy was like, bro, you should do astrophysics. Astrophysics, hell dope. And uh, I thought to myself, you know, why not? I could always switch it back. And I asked a lady, uh, the admin lady, and she was like, "Yeah, you can switch it back if you don't like it." So, so that's how I um, that's how I ended up doing it, and and then I absolutely fell in love with it. You know, so mm-hmm. sometimes the best things in life come at from unexpected places, right? Yeah, I think so, and that's a really good segue to my next question of unexpected places or even just unexpected things. Um, what is Planet Nine? Can you break it down for someone who's watching this and is like, I've never heard of this before. What is the basic um, definition that you would put behind Planet Nine? It's a five to maybe 10 Earth mass object that we think orbits the sun with a really long period, about once every 10, 20,000 years. We can see the gravitational influence that it exerts upon the outer solar system, but we have never seen the object directly. So it's a it's a planet whose entire existence right is derived from the gravitational sculpting that it instills upon a distant field of debris, or basically icy asteroids that lurk beyond the orbit of Neptune. Okay, uh, but that said, we have never directly seen any light reflected off of this object. So then, what makes you think it exists then? Uh, The structure of the outer solar system. So if you go beyond Neptune, there's this um, asteroid belt uh, with icy asteroids, and then we call the Kuiper belt because Kuiper was the guy who kind of speculated a lot about the existence of such a belt back in the 50s. And if you go and kind of zoom out and look at the most distant orbits that we know of in this field of debris, then you will see that they all point to to one direction. And this is particularly um, evident in the subset of orbits that are not strongly affected by Neptune. So the things that are kind of pristine, that are not strongly uh, messed up by the other giant planets of the solar system, uh, all point in the same direction. That's a gravitational one-way sign, if you will, that some more distant object is confining these orbits gravitationally, keeping them together. So a lot of, you know, perhaps an analogy uh, would be You know, if you're in downtown LA, for example, and you hear, you know, sirens, right? You know that there's a cop car somewhere or there's a ambulance somewhere and you haven't seen it, right? So it's here, it's the same thing only with gravity. You see the gravitational influence that this planet exerts on the orbits of little icy asteroids, but you don't know precisely where the thing is. Now, have you been gathering evidence of this over a course of years now, or is it it's just been, and, and should I even ask, is there even any recent evidence that you have that, that has been released? Well, yeah. So, you know, we've been, my partner in crime, Mike Brown, and I have been at this for now something like seven years. It's crazy to think about a little bit. Um, but 
Yeah, when we started out in and kind of first were formulating the basics of the model, you know, we started out with a very limited number of or a limited amount of data, limited number of orbits that we knew of in the outer solar system. I think it was six. Uh, these days, that data set has grown to something like is it some 24, I think. And some of the predictions that we made back in the day where we kind of um, expected to, to see this correlation between how stable these objects are, right? How uh, kind of how little their orbits diffuse, right? To correlate with the degree of clustering and, and all of that has come true. And in parallel, there's been these other, you know, modes of, of Planet Nine's gravitational influence that we have discovered along the way and then looked for them in the data. So, so it's been a slowly developing story. And at this point, it it's pretty, um, you know, it's a pretty well formulated kind of self-consistent uh, picture where I would say if you don't have planet nine in the solar system, the the number of mysteries that suddenly you have to resolve um, is a pretty substantial number. I mean, there's there's not just one line of evidence for this object. There There's like four different gravitational lines of evidence. So something is gravitationally sculpting the outer solar system, right? There's some kind of gravitational field out there. That's amazing. And there are people that beg to differ. Uh, I did read a study that it was the infrared um, astronomical satellite and then the Akari satellite, uh, space telescope survey done about 20 years apart points to it. It's, they say that it's echoes of faint nebulas and not planet nine. What do you, what do you say to skeptics? And what do you say to other people that don't agree with your theory? Uh, so there are, there are plenty of uh, people that you know are, are skeptical, and I think it's really important to remember that the whole scientific enterprise is to be skeptical, right? The right science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. So I think uh, it's a very um, it's a very healthy uh, thing to do to to kind of probe, uh, you know, to probe any model that that comes out, and so. With Planet Nine, there have been a few things that people have brought up over the years, um, and you know, upon closer examination, right, the the kind of counter ideas or counter hypotheses don't tend to hold up to to the evidence. So uh, that said, you know, it only takes one to completely, right? It only takes one to completely undo the whole story, and. I'm by no means a religious person, right? I'm, I, uh, so I don't have any belief in the existence of Planet Nine beyond the evidence that points to it. And um, I think the study that you are referring to was an observational study where what it is, they they collected a bunch of uh, data sources that look like Planet Nine, and then one by one went through and ruled out their own results, meaning Said, is that planet nine? No. Is that one planet nine? Also, no. But they did not. Um, that that study does not negate the existence of planet nine. They just haven't found it, right? There. So it's it's a little bit different. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, and and I know some media outlets that have reported that when you know I can see that they do take it and they spin it or they put it into their own context. So I'm glad that you clarified that because it did come from a competitor of the debrief and not our own reporting. Um, the other question yeah. I want to ask you then too is like looking at technologies moving forward. If you now had all the technology that you could possibly use to look for planet nine, you know, what would you be using now and what would you get your hands on to be able to look for the planet consistently? And what would you, what would you be hoping for in the future as well? Well, so we've over the last, you know, really seven years been using optical observatories to do huge telescopes, particularly right. the Subaru telescope, which is the Japanese national observatory, eight meter, you know, mirror so a huge massive thing and we've been looking for planet nine obviously have not directly detected it and one of the things that um we've discovered and i'm not an observer by training i'm a theorist by training so this was kind of my first foray into really doing observational work one of the things that i've discovered is that um you're not in control when you're doing observational astronomy right when when you're doing theory 
it's just you against the problem, right? Do some math, have a great time, whatever. Yeah, mm -hmm. When you're doing observations, you're up at the telescope and you hope that the weather is good and you hope that the atmosphere is not turbulent and you hope that the telescope doesn't break and you need this to, you need to succeed three nights in a row because if you don't, then that's kind of swath of data is useless. And so, so much of our time, our telescope time has gone into just, uh, you know, the trash can because we, one of the nights something would go wrong and then you kind of can't, can't really use the data. Um, <clears throat> so what to do? Of course, one approach is to keep on going with the op uh, optical and the approach I like a little bit better is the idea of using spacecraft telemetry. So if you use spacecraft, uh, and I put spacecraft around giant planet Jupiter. You can also put little spacecraft around Mars, for example, uh, and even Earth. Then uh, you can try to do the exercise of kind of pinning down where Planet Nine is through its direct pull on kind of planetary orbits right now. Not try to infer its existence or whatever from uh, you know the overall structure that it has shaped over billions of years, but like, where is the pull coming from right now? That's an, we haven't done much with it, but there's a great, there's a group in France that have uh, done some work with Cassini data, Cassini was a spacecraft in orbit around Saturn and Juno data, which is a spacecraft around Jupiter. And um, they're, they're getting results that are, that are at the very least promising. So I'm currently kind of excited about doing it that way more than anything else. Yeah, that's super exciting. And that's good to hear. My next question was after that, it was to ask you about the James Webb telescope. Would it be something that you would look to use possibly as well? If you're looking at Cassini and, and a lot of other crafts, why not the James Webb? Um, the short answer is that James Webb has a field of view that's so small that it's like looking for your target using you know a high caliber sniper rifle. Right, you, it's good for interrogation, um, an infrared interrogation of specific, um, of like once you find it, you know, asking questions like what is its atmosphere made out of, but it's not a good search tool. So, so James Webb is useless for this endeavor. Now, what about if you're looking at the structure or the shape um, of Planet Nine? That's a theory of it now. Like, is it a gas giant? Is it is it rock? What have you What have you thought of, of what that it might be? So the amazing thing is we don't know, right? All okay. we know is I mean, because gravity, the, the gravity is gravity. So you can be five Earth masses of rock. You can be five Earth masses of ice plus hydrogen. You can be a five Earth mass burrito. Like the gravitational field of these things will be the same. And uh, because of that, we really don't cannot say anything quantitative about the composition. What we can do though, is sort of make quasi-educated guesses. And Generally, things that are five to 10 Earth masses form in the protoplanetary disk while hydrogen and helium is still present in large abundances. So you would kind of expect from planet formation considerations, the object to have a hydrogen helium atmosphere. And this is an assumption that is in part driven by enthusiasm and kind of optimism, because if it has a... Uh, hydrogen helium atmosphere it's easier to find um so but but that's kind of the extent to to which we can speculate we really don't know anything about what what it is made out of and there's been uh at least one paper uh suggesting that planet nine perhaps is a primordial black hole right okay and which would be a black hole about this size um i don't think that there's enough evidence to to suggest that it is a black hole and the fact that we haven't directly seen it yet does not, you know, warrant, at, at least for now, kind of inference something as exotic, but, you know, it just goes on to highlight that all we know about this object is its orbit and its mass. That's it. Right.
Now, what if, yeah. you know, we find planet nine, is there a possibility there's even more now outside our, outside our solar system that would be possible? Is that even still a consideration? You know, we know that, well, if we look at, we technically planet 10, like Pluto is a planet, not a planet, it's a planet, it's not a planet. <laughs> we look at, right, and if we now it is a planet again, but if we look at finding, you know, something that is planet nine, do we even have the ability to be able to find that something else that, that might be outside in the outside of planet nine itself? Um, there, there's at present only evidence for a single object, right? But the solar system generically has quite a bit of real estate beyond, uh, beyond the orbit of Neptune. So it's not unreasonable by any account to suggest that, you know, there's more stuff there. It's just that, you know, generically, you don't want to be in the, in a game of kind of suggesting that their material, something exists just because it can, right? Within the case with Planet Nine, you kind of see its gravitational echo, if you will, and you kind of know that something is out there for that reason. Could it be multiple objects in principle? Yes, but that would be an additional complication in the theory, uh, which is not warranted by the data and sort of Occam's razor pushes you towards a simpler explanation. Right. And that, and that makes sense as well. Now, yeah. moving forward, if we're, you know, if we're looking at the solar system entirely, mm -hmm. do you think yourself personally, and even just from when, what you've been reading and studying that there is some form of any biological life form that's just in a smaller form that's maybe developing within our solar system? Uh, maybe. In fact, I have, so the, the answer is I have no idea, right? Like right. I have no <laughs> idea. Well, I will tell you that uh, I'll tell you this, the notion that life exists elsewhere outside of the earth, in my opinion, is not an interesting question at all, because the answer is, of course, it does, right? There's no, it is a statistical impossibility that the earth is the only place where life exists. There's, life is not some, you know, magical thing. We don't understand how it comes about. We don't know how it forms right, how it starts. But right. what we do know is that for a long time, the earth was just covered in bacterial mats. It's not my particularly interesting life, but, you know, life is a consequence of some biochemistry that, that you know, happened on earth early on in the evolution of the planet. There's no reason at all to suspect that the earth is somehow special in this regard. There's, you know, uh, and a countless number of other planets where such conditions presumably are also met. The more interesting question, which I think you're, you're asking, is how close is the nearest life, right? Do we have to travel halfway across the galaxy to find the first, you know, other bacterial mat? Or do we go to Mars? Like, is there subsurface life on Mars that's just like sitting below the surface? Or right. I'm probably not but maybe or is it europa is it the icy satellites right. of jupiter that where you know life lives uh next to hydrothermal vents and there's a great um there's a great meme that one of my grad students showed me with two worms at the bottom of the ocean hanging out you know next to some hydrothermal vent and one of the other ones saying do you think there could be life on the surface and the other one goes like Probably not. I mean, how would they how would they get the energy? Like they are not next to a hydrothermal vent, right? And that's yeah, good point. You know, so so I think that this probably in some ways like a lot of our speculation about the energetics of of how life works um, is somewhat limited by our own imagination. Um, you know, then there's an, another question, right? Um, if life starts somewhere, right? can you kill it can you completely wipe it out now i've tried to kill it in like my kitchen and i can't right you, you can you can try to sanitize uh your your kitchen to the best extent possible but if you leave it alone for not too long right life always kind of finds a way so that in itself is an is an interesting uh consideration to keep in mind that if life hasn't does not have a hard time starting some places, right? Then maybe it's somewhere deep 
even even if we don't see it on the surface for even on earth there is you know there are organisms under extreme conditions like living deep you know in the um deep beneath beneath the surface so i know there's a very long-winded no it's fabulous lit, yeah it's true you know um abstract detour of an answer but th these are just some of the musings that i uh that i have on the topic yeah i think that's fabulous and it's something that we always think we're always looking for something that is more intelligent life form maybe even more than us and we're not you know i would say sometimes in a greater mainstream conversation and just the average people instead of looking at things that are smaller you know life forms that are starting and because i think you're right i think it's a really great analogy of looking at cleaning your your top of your desk or anything and knowing that maybe 1% of that's still going to be alive and it will grow and it will change and it will evolve and it will keep going. So, um, isn't that life too, in general? <laughs> oh, I mean, sure. And, and it's, it's, I think it's important to remember that the life that we think of as life, like humans and animals and even dinosaurs, right? That's very, very recent in the history of the earth itself. For the longest time, if you go up and go outside and pick up a stromatolite, which is a rock with these kind of um, you know, lines through it, and the reason it, those lines exist is it's bacteria, right? It's bacterial mats that got fossilized and now are embedded into the rock and super common. It's virtually anywhere on earth that you can go, you can pick up stromatolite, even old stromatolite that's billions of years old. And you see this, and that's for a long time, like that's all it was. Life was this really boring thing that was just chilling on the surface, not doing anything, just reproducing slowly. So the criteria for what counts as life um, are really much lower than, than what we often think of. We often think of like aliens as these bipedal you know, green things landing with, with blasters and starting to, to shoot, you know, and take over buildings and stuff. But I don't know. I mean, even on earth, like if you ask like are bees, you know, what, what are the interests of bees, right? The interests of bees, bees have no interest in, uh, you know, shooting lasers into into each other's eyes. Right? So, so I think it's it's very difficult to kind of divorce ourselves from our our human perspective to break out of that loop of what we interpret as life or even intelligent life. For right, you could you know, point again at the example of bees. I mean, they are highly sophisticated, structured kind of species that have some form of collective intelligence right but but they're certainly very very different from mammals um once again overly long like answer that just keeps going on so please cut me off when no i think it's no it's it's fabulous because i even outside of planet nine i think it's something that we have to look at because we have all these culture feedback loops that's given through us through entertainment and through news and recently obviously and all the uap conversations that are happening you know around the world and specifically in north america so when we're looking at intelligent life like why isn't that some form of intelligence i agree there's structure there's community there's things that are relatable it's life on its own, it's breathing, it's living. Um, so I think that is something that we have to look at and we have to respect, you know, I think that's a big thing moving forward is if we're going to be moving into our outer solar system and looking at different planets and looking to see if there's biological life, I think we have to talk about what that means. What does that mean to us? And, and even how do we respect it? We have a hard time doing it here. So the answer is there's life in the, um, in the oceans of Europa. It's like, sign me up. I love seafood. Let's fish it out and let's go. You know. Now, how I have to ask then, how big would you, would you assume that something like that would live? Do, do they think it's microscopic? Do they, do they think it's larger? We know we have pop culture and we, I forget the movies, the, the abyss that's uh, Europa. I forget which one it is. Uh, um, yeah, it's like, a, it's a, yeah, it's a great movie. I forget what it's called though. Um, but they're, you know, they're always thinking, everyone always thinks it's like a Nessie or a Loch Ness monster of some sort. But if we had to look at Europa, I would assume that it would be very small. 
Um, maybe. Sure. Maybe, <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things that is clear is that with life, you have a um, sort of a certain size distribution, right? Right. I mean, you you have more and more stuff, the smaller you're willing to go. And that's just like gets worked into the way that the food chain works. Like a bear eats factor of 10 more of its own weight in salmon per year. So you need obviously a lot more salmon to sustain a bear. So, so um, you know, you could make those kinds of arguments or, um, but, but it, it's hard because we're, we're just dealing with a, with a single data point. This is the only environment, right? Earth is the only environment that we really know well. So we're doing our best in extrapolating from it. And I think the, in such situations, one of the things that just solar system exploration has taught us is that whenever we do such an exploration, uh, with such an extrapolation of taking something that we think we understand about how things work, we're always disproven, at least, at, you know, at least at the detailed level. So it's been very, it, it's been rare when planetary science has been a, successful in making predictions that kind of come true. It's been especially true in, in my field, the field of planet formation, right? Like planet formation always gets things wrong on the first try and you have to kind of re keep rebuilding uh, your model. So because of that, I would expect that if we are able to detect life, you know, and the subsurface ocean somewhere in the solar system or on Mars or whatever, or there's even talk of life on Venus now with phosphine you know, detections. Um, the, what we can be certain of is that we'll be surprised. Right? Whatever it turns out to be will be nothing like what we expected it to be. I agree. I 100% agree. I don't think that there's a lot that we don't know and obviously something that we'll never be able to wrap our heads around. I think that we're ever growing and we're ever learning. And we always think as humans that we know what the answer is, but then it always surprises us. So I 100% agree with that. And all different types of science and all different types of astronomy. I really do believe that. Um, yeah, I think this is one of the things that science does well is science is a is a is not really even a collection of facts, right? Science is a mode of thinking where you are always trying to poke holes in your own understanding. It, it's a very, um, you know, it's a very unconventional thing. And in a way, this the full kind of methodology of science was only developed relatively recently. And it's a fundamentally like uncomfortable mode of existence when you're always doubting your own ideas. Um, but it's been at the same time so efficient in kind of successively approximating the truth. Um, so it's a, it's a beautiful enterprise. Now, I'd love that you said that looking and doubting your own ideas, because I don't know if all scientists are, are they? You know, that might be something that is a standard that they go by, but it's sometimes it's so hard to move the science community into another way of thinking or observing or looking um, for something else because they're so stuck to a canon, let's say, or uh, a way of thinking or also based on ridicule. You know, it's, it's hard to move the science community direction. So I like that you're saying poking holes, but do you, would you agree or disagree that like, maybe that's not always the case because of those other elements? I mean, so I think that a good scientist can uh, um, a good scientist can can rapidly tell the difference between kind of a, an idea that has no merit and an idea that does, right? Because there, there, are, uh, when, right? It's different, right? It's different to say that we're always poking, trying to poke holes in in our own theories that's different from saying we have no idea what we're doing, right? Uh, so the, um, I think that when you look at kind of the, um, the way that scientific theories get constructed, they are, uh, you know, once they're developed into, into something that, you know, is somewhat at least self-consistent, right? There's a, they rest on pillars of evidence and they rest on, in my field, right? In astrophysics, they rest on well-defined mathematical kind of formalisms. And 
that you know enterprise is different from say coming in and saying well i think that you know gravity works a different way and i'm just going to make stuff up right so a good scientist can can dismiss the the stuff that is unfounded rapidly and at the same time give proper attention to an idea that is maybe not as well developed yet but one one that has a lot of potential and um Almost always, if you kind of look at the history of science, the development of um, theories does not progress in this manner where you build something and then you say, no, that was a horrible idea and really dumb. Let's break it down and just forget about it and start from scratch. It's that you build something and you realize, okay, it's, it doesn't work here. And that's because what you've built is an approximation to a deeper truth. Okay, and then you you kind of when you quote unquote break it down, you don't really break it down entirely. You realize in way new ways in which you've only seen the kind of tip of the iceberg, right? Take Newtonian gravity, right? Newton's right. gravity, right? Newton, Newton's law of gravity is a great law. It's, it's not the fundamental truth, but it works really really well for most things. Right, it fails at the level of you know in the solar system. Right, it does not predict forty-three arc seconds per century of extra precession of Mercury's orbit, but that's it. Right, <laughs> when you when you kind of poke at the planetary dynamics, it it's a really really great theory, except for a tiny little error, and that tiny little error then gives rise to the theory Einstein's theory of general relativity, which is much more sophisticated closer to the truth theory of gravity. But from relativity, you can derive Newton's gravity and say, okay, this is now, you can naturally see how it arises as an approximation. So um, again, I, I don't wanna make the, make the impression that you know, good scientists sit around and just kind of throw away the books that we, we have and decide that it's all nonsense. So that you build and you look for failure modes of existing models. I think that was really well said and really well explained as well. When you're looking for Planet Nine, you know, you've might have had so many challenges probably working in your field and people agreeing and not agreeing. What are some of those hurdles and challenges that you've had to overcome over these past seven years looking? Yeah, well, well the first is just the there's a frustration when things are outside of your control. Right. If you're collecting data and suddenly the dome breaks or fog rolls in, you have to close and you know that you're just kind of wasting your cycles, it's at some level frustrating. Right. You, you kind of have to live with it. You got to be OK with with that uh, with that feeling. But it is nonetheless frustrating on the theoretical side, you know, stuff that I work on more. Sometimes uh, you're just limited by your own mathematical ability, right? You're trying to work stuff out, and and you can't. You're running up against a wall of things do not work out. You don't understand how it works, and you don't understand, and you don't understand. And so um, that's you know like ninety five percent, maybe ninety nine percent of your time uh, doing research is this feeling of deep discomfort with the fact that you're you can't solve the problem and occasionally you make you make a little breakthrough here and there and then you start to unravel so the whole thing the whole enterprise is steeped in a feeling of being okay with stuff not working out it's hard. It's hard, <laughs> especially when you're always up against your own and your, if it's your own knowledge or your own ability as well. But I would imagine then you're looking into your greater team then to be able to, to say, Hey, I'm stuck up against a math equation, or I'm stuck up against this kind of calculation. Then I have to now go outward into my team, um, and be able to, to find some of those, um, I would imagine some of those answers. Right. So, um, I have, you know, throughout my career, been really, really fortunate to work with great people. And in this regard, you know, I, I the team that, you know, the, the kind of collaborations that I form usually don't involve a lot of people, but but they're very close. They're kind of tightening in. So, um, so absolutely. And 
you know, we have a great working relationship with my kind of partner in crime, Mike Brown, my other partner in crime, Alessandro Morbidelli, you know, and my partner in crime, Fred Adams, you know, the, the list goes on really. But, um, you know, and then also there's, there's my research group, right? And uh, I have a great relationship with, with all of them. Um, you know, I talk science all the time with Juliet, my, my kind of senior postdoc, and she is re really fantastic. Uh, so absolutely bouncing your ideas off of people is a great way to kind of break your own cycle because that's the that's the part that that you kind of end up inevitably falling into if you're working on something you're kind of obsessive you keep going in a circle and the kind of deeper you go the more the more the more uh you know rigid you get and having other people's input uh helps a lot in kind of viewing things from a different perspective a hundred percent. Now looking at things and viewing them from a different perspective, I have to ask this just in pure curiosity for myself and, and what you think we hear so much when it comes into folklore about planet X and obviously, which they connect to planet nine. And we look at, you know, folklore with, um, the Anunnaki, uh, based on the Sumerian culture and civilization. So what's your thoughts around that? And because people have, must have asked you multiple times, yeah. uh, about about is planet nine planet X and is it new bureau and is it the destroyer? There's so much of this folklore, especially within the UAP community. They love to talk about that. So I was curious to see what your thoughts are based on it. I, so I'll be honest, I had no yeah. idea what any of that was until, you know, the planet nine, like, you know, project started and, um, you know, I, I have to say, I still don't, I'm not well versed in the details, let's just say, uh, of this, but as far as I can tell, it's complete nonsense, right? And, and as far as I can tell, it's some, uh, like, some guy made it up in like the 90s, right? It, and, and so, I, as far as I can, again, this is my uninformed of the details of, of Nibiru and, and whatnot, but I think it's just like, um, it's imagination, but it's, it is interesting, right? That if you look, I mean, if you look closely, it's not the same orbit, but if you look, you kind know, of don't know very much about Kepler and orbital elements and stuff, you know, this like, the story is like, yeah, it's an eccentric thing uh, that um, is supposed to, someone explained it to me a long time ago. I think it's like supposed to come through and grab some rocks and it's like it doesn't impact the earth but the rocks impact the earth i some believe uh, something like that yeah i believe that no, the yeah. nibiru the destroyer destroys earth um because in the, at the anunnaki i believe during the, the um mesopotamia there was multiple different religions and there was multiple different folklore i will say um in that time and this was one of them right uh, and there's a lot of conversations about it being negative too because you know you usually get the people that are obviously in power or um or ruling let's say sometimes drive that narrative so that is something that was was obviously pulled out and then uh, blown up into into mainstream pop culture culture uh, especially within the uap community yeah so it's i believe it's the destroyer supposed to come and and destroy the rest of earth um after it has we've it has it will come by i think it's x i don't even know how many years it is but we will at some point find it so there is this you know it, it's just the the funny time where people are talking about it and and you're looking for planet uh or looking for planet nine with the, with the way things are going, uh, you know, the destroyer is going to come and be pretty disappointed. Like my job here is done for me before I even had the chance to launch the rocks or whatever, you know, <laughs> right? Um, no, I, I don't. I don't know, uh, frankly, enough to to comment in in any um, any informed matter about um, about any of the like you know religious aspects of this, but from what I have seen, and I've gotten a staggering number of uh, kind of rambling emails about uh, Nibiru, this and that. Um, as far as I can tell, it's completely, it's like not self-consistent at all. Um, but, but I, again, I have not paid enough attention. You know, I, it's like, you know, I, I only have so many hours in the day. 
But hey, that makes sense. And that's fair. I had to ask because any viewer of ours um, would have been like, at least ask that question, Chrissy, because we're curious. Um, and I was too, I was curious to see what you thought about just because you are looking for, for Planet Nine. So what happens okay. next? You find Planet Nine and then what is your next steps directly after that? You know, what, what do you do next when it comes to learning more about the planet? So the uh, I'm glad you asked this question because the process of directly detecting Planet Nine, confirming that it's there, uh, as exciting as it is as a, as a moment, and you know, I promise that we'll party super hard as soon as we we find it. Well, uh, you know, we would have learned exactly nothing, right? Because if we confirm that it's there, great, but we don't. We already sort of would have known that it's there. The real hard work then starts immediately after. Is then That's when you start to interrogate the nature of this object. And you say, what is its atmosphere made out of? Does it have many moons? Um, the number of questions is really endless. And here's where it gets interesting. The solar system, um, if you kind of just go up and tally up the planets in terms of their masses, you, know, you, you have this big gap between the Earth and Uranus and Neptune. So the Earth, of course, is one Earth mass, and Uranus and Neptune are 17 Earth masses, or I think it's 17, whatever it is, it's, it's a number like that, maybe it's 18. And Planet Nine, conversely, falls into this like five Earth mass regime, which we now know is the common outcome of planet formation throughout the galaxy. Most planets that we see that orbit other stars are a few Earth masses. So Planet Nine, if we find it, constitutes the closest window that we have towards the typical planet that inhabits th this galaxy. And uh, I find that to be really, really interesting, right? We Planets that orbit other stars, it's, it's really, really hard to interrogate them directly. We, we can't see them directly. We can also kind of only kind of indirectly probe things about them. Planet Nine, it would be in our solar system and we would learn so much about the Genesis story of our solar system and ge generically, what are the physical processes that drive planet formation? I mean, think about it. That's the best story ever told. Right, there is no better story than the story of how planetary systems form, uh, at least in my view, and and it would it would be a huge chapter. It would be a huge again thread through which we could unravel so much of the detail. So I'm really excited about this. Yeah, and what are you hoping for? Like, what are you hoping for when you find that planet, and and then what that will look like after? Like, what would be your best scenario? That's the thing. I don't have a best scenario. I know that whatever I hope for will be completely wrong. It's so much better to not hope for anything and just kind of go in with no bias on what you're going to find. We're going to, when we find it, right, we're going to be totally surprised. It's going to be some really weird thing. Uh, and we, we can't even imagine yet what, how weird it's going to be. And it's exciting. Weird is good though. Where it's where it's the best, especially when sometimes when it's in the solar system. And I think the surprise is wonderful. How close do you think you are to finding it? If you had to approximate, and I know this is really hard because you just never know, but you know, you started seven years ago. You know, where how close do you think you are now? Because obviously technology is advancing and you're using more um, technology to help you. How close are you? So we are either years away like a small number of years away or um, a small number of, or, or like a decade away or a decade or two. And here's why. Uh, at the end of this year, maybe early in the coming year, the Vera Rubin Observatory um, in Chile is coming online. That's sort of the next generation of um, next generation observatory. And it's, it's a great uh, machine that basically opens up every night and goes like this to the night sky and kind of scans a large fraction of it. So it's a very efficient survey uh, to look for um, stuff in the solar system. So either it'll find planet nine, or at the very least, it'll find so many of these Kuiper belt objects that are sculpted by planet nine that the theory will kind of come into sharper focus. So a 
new development, if you will, in the Planet Nine, like, you know, project and Planet Nine hypothesis is going to be happening within the next year or two. Um, so, so in that regard, um, there is uh, room for considerable optimism. But again, uh, it's really important to not, uh, I think, uh, I guess, in this case, we I can tell you what, what I'm hoping for. What I'm hoping for is it'll just find a damn thing. And we can, you know, go on to the next stage. But even if not, uh, we'll find something, something interesting. And uh, my sense is that we will be puzzled. We will be puzzled a large fraction of the time because we're always puzzled. That's that's good though. It's yeah. not a bad thing. <laughs> we always, thing you know, you is. answer one question and then it opens up a hundred more. Right. I think that's how that usually yeah. works. Uh, my last question yeah. to you outside of just looking for planet nine, what else are you working on? Oh, um, I'm working these days quite a bit on planet formation theory uh, and the questions of generally how planetary systems form. We actually had a, our latest paper accepted for publication yesterday. So Thanks, that's uh, coming out. Thanks. Yeah, it's going to be. And uh, in parallel, I'm doing some work on just kind of applied chaos theory in the outer solar system as well. So I've, I've got a ton of different things I'm, I'm always working on and perhaps most um you know most excitingly on the um on a on a somewhat different front from science i've uh, i've really developed a deep interest in natural language processing uh so our artificial intelligence and getting uh computers to kind of write text in a way that's indistinguishable from uh human text so we started a company that specializes in generating long form text that is written by uh, a computer uh, called Lucinetic. And it's just been, that's been, that project's been going really well. And we're making all kinds of rapid progress in that uh, sphere. So it's, it's frankly uh, at times a little scary how much the AI knows, um, you know, but, uh, but it's exciting. And thank you so much. And as I said, everybody, thank you for being rebelliously curious with me today. Thanks so much, Chrissy. Thanks. Real pleasure.